Well, thanks so, so much for being here. Good afternoon and welcome to the Ethics Institute's Dorset panel discussion on the topic of politics, character, and leadership in the 21st century. I'm Anya Donovan, the Executive Director of the Ethics Institute, along with my colleague Ron Green, the Faculty Director of the Institute. Um, we're really pleased to welcome you, you here this afternoon. Uh, before introducing our panelists, let me mention that this panel and a public lecture by Michael Beschkloss at 4.30 this afternoon are both made possible by the generous gift of Bert and Trixie Dorset. Unfortunately, Bert could not be with, be with us here today, but he is an enthusiastic supporter of the work of the Ethics Institute. Bert is a 1953 graduate of Dartmouth College, and throughout his career in business, he saw the necessity of integrating ethics into every aspect of professional life. As proof of that commitment, he has funded the Dorset Lectureships. In choosing the theme and speaker for this year, we couldn't help but have the election in mind. And we are fortunate to have a panel of distinguished speakers to discuss the current state of affairs regarding ethics and political leadership. First, we have John Burns, currently serving as the 2008 Montgomery Fellow here at Dartmouth. Mr. Burns is the foreign correspondent for the New York Times. He has covered the Middle East, South Africa, China, where he was charged with espionage and imprisoned, and many other hotspots around the world. Mr. Burns has won two Pulitzer Prizes, the George Polk Award, the Wendell Prize, and most interesting to me, the Burton Benjamin Award that described him as, quote, the eyes and ears for much of the American public. Next, I have the honor of introducing someone that many of you already know, Madeline Cunin, the former governor of Vermont. Ms. Cunin served as Vermont state legislator, lieutenant governor, and governor from 1985 to 1991. <coughs> Excuse me. She has also served as the ambassador to Switzerland, the country where she was born, and left at an early age when the threat of the Holocaust became, became clear to her parents. Prior to her term as U.S. ambassador, Ms. Cunin served as U.S. Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Education in the Clinton administration. Her book, which you can see in front of her, is probably the most read copy of the book. Um, I do want to mention, after this event, we'll have a, a book signing at the Dartmouth Bookstore. Um, it's, <laughs> it's well thumbed through with a lot of notes in it. Um, we hope to hear her comment on the role of women in politics um, this mm -hmm. afternoon. Last but certainly not least on our panel is Dean Lacey from the Gov Dartmouth Government Department. Professor Lacey received his BA from the University of Virginia and his PhD from Duke University and previously held teaching appointments at Duke, The Ohio State University, and the University of Michigan, as well as research appointments at Stanford University. His research on elections, public opinion, the presidency, and lawmaking has appeared in the American Journal of Political Science, the British Journal of Political Science, the Journal of Politics, and other publications. He was an international election observer during the 2000 presidential election in Taiwan and has worked on several state and national political campaigns. It is a pleasure to have Professor Lacey on this distinguished panel. I've asked each of our speakers to give about five to ten minutes of comment on just sort of the state of affairs and politics right now, tie that into ethics, moral character, gave them free reign. So whatever you want to talk about for five to ten minutes, our primary purpose here is to really open it up to you and be able to have a discussion with each of these panelists. So we'll start first with John Burns, move on to Madeline, and wrap it up with Dean. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> First thing I want to say is that it's daunting to be in the company of somebody, and I'm speaking of the governor here, who's actually been in the arena. Um, and I think it's as well for people who are in what Teddy Roosevelt would have called the bleachers. Use the microphone. Sorry. Uh, as well for those of us who spent our lives in what Teddy Roosevelt called the bleachers. Timid souls, pallid souls, did he call us? Uh, to recognize that. Um, also to recognize that when we come to talk about matters of ethics, um, we do well to consider our own profession. Um, and I think we are very far, very far, um, although we have, I think, made some uh, considerable advances in the course of my career in this. Um, and anybody who lived through the last five years of the New York Times uh, or anybody who reads the New York Times would know that we've had our own serious ethical issues to address. Um, there are many others to address, which if we were in another forum on another occasion I would talk about, I often think uh, 
the book I really should write is about that. Uh, I feel profoundly uneasy <coughs> with journalists who sit in judgment or feel appointed to sit in judgment on people in public life and do not at least moderate what they have to say about that with um, some, sense, some sense, conveying some sense of our own failings um, and also conveying some sense of how much, how different, as I've already said, it is to be in the arena than it is to be in the bleachers. I personally dislike, I would say, loathe self-righteousness, um, particularly in my own profession. And I think, it's, I think it's a plague and it's something that we should guard against. As a foreigner in this country, as one who's worked 35 years now, um, for a great American institution um, and never felt, I have to say, that I carried any handicap as a result. Um, I want to say that from that alone I have taken one important lesson about America, which is uh, to me redolent of a much wider truth about this country, and that is that uh, in good times and bad, I think you have created um, on the shoulders of those brave people who crossed the ocean in 1620, and a society that is more civil and more driven by a sense of right and wrong, um, of, if you will, ethics, than any other on earth. I think I've earned the right to say that, not just because I'm not an American, but because um, I've spent much of my life traveling uh, on the far horizons of the earth, and it's not particularly fashionable to say that, say this in, in this day and age. But when I say God bless America, I really mean it. Uh, there are, of course, tremendous failings in American public life. Uh, many people in this room would probably say that we've seen more than a proportionate share of them in the last few years. Um, but this country still is the great hope of mankind. And. Uh, it's always struck me as being one of the paradoxes of our times, that in almost any great city in the world you can find the public squares at least once a month packed with people who are demonstrating against America, my own country amongst them. But if you go around to the, very often outside the American embassies too, if you go around the side to the door where the consulate general is, you'll find crowds almost as large trying to fight their way into America. And there's a reason for that because this country still represents uh, the great hope of mankind. And, and as for the present situation, um, I would ask, uh, encourage Americans to take heart that this country has been through uh, tired and difficult times before and has found, unlike some other empires I can think of, um, has found its way back. Um, and I think you will again. And it has to do partly with the fact that you have a charter, a very clear charter that every American child learns <coughs> uh, from their earliest days in high school. I think those uh, civics classes in high school are absolutely fundamental. Um, you have a charter and you kept your doors open and your minds open in ways that many other countries don't uh, without prejudice to what will happen on Tuesday. I would say that the, the best current example of that is the Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States. What a remarkable thing that is, whether he wins or loses. Uh, that within 40 years or so of Lyndon Johnson's great society, within little more than a half a century of Brown versus Board of Education, that this country could be on the verge, possibly, of electing um, an African American to the presidency, to me, is just one reason for thinking that this country and its historic ability to reinvent itself will not fail uh, on this occasion either. Um, since I've come back from the two great wars, which are so controversial in this country, I think I should also say that whatever you make, and we're really talking about Iraq since Afghanistan is much the less controversial of the two, that you could make a case, which is often made in the left-wing journals of the world, against America on the basis of Abu Ghraib or Haditha or the things that went wrong, or indeed the decision to raid Iraq in the first place and the massaging and distortion of intelligence.
But in my mind, you can make a much more compelling case, make of what you will of these wars, um, for the extraordinary caliber of the people whose responsibility it has been to conduct these wars in America's name. I'm talking about um, the agencies of the United States government, the State Department, and other agencies, including the, the intelligence agencies, and above all, the United States Armed Forces. Um, I'm the son of a military officer. I grew up on military bases in Germany. Uh, I grew up with a father who was, uh, as a South African, profoundly uneasy with what I described last week as this kind of low to medium voltage anti-Americanism that was then prevalent and I'm afraid still is to some extent in the upper reaches of the British bureauc bureaucracy and armed forces, uh, which has a lot to do with empire usurped, in my view. Um, and he was a great admirer of the American military in Germany in the 1950s when he was a commander in the northern forces of NATO. Um, and where, to, to his dying day, um, he was so proud of being able to reach into his wallet and fetch out a, a United States military identification card issued to him on maneuvers in South Germany in 1956, where in a Jeep driven by a, a black African-American sergeant, they lost their way in the fog on the Nuremberg Plain, and the driver found some tanks parked at an intersection somewhere out on the plain. So I'll just go and ask these guys and see if they can find where the field headquarters is. Came running back in a field in a, in a mood of great excitement. He said, there's somebody I want you to meet. So my father, probably in some disgruntlement as a fairly senior general, got out of the Jeep and wandered over to the tanks where he was introduced to Elvis Presley, <laughs> <laughs> who signed his military identification card, which I still have on my office <laughs> wall. It was the proudest moment of his 40-year he, he was a Battle of Britain fighter pilot, but that was the best moment of his military career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> let me just say uh, I've admired John Byrne, seeing him courageously on the evening news and uh, his byline in the New York Times, and I think I was one of the many, many Americans who worried about your safety and... Uh, and admired your courage. Um, you know, what we need most to define who our leaders are is information. And um, I think covering a war is probably one of the hardest uh, things to do. But let me leap to what I understand to be the question, though it's very broad. I think we could say most anything. but. I decided to focus in on the question of character. How do we define character? And my most simple definition of that is authenticity. If you can come off as being sincere of really believing in what you espouse. And I think people sometimes fail that test uh, when they say one thing and do another. And of course, the press is very hard, and so is the public um, on occasions when the two conflict. Sometimes, of course, you have to retract, and I'm glad you appreciate what politicians have to do uh, because circumstances change. But sometimes that's explainable, and sometimes it is not. But I think we saw a small recent example that caught a lot of attention, and that is uh, Sarah Palin's wardrobe. Um, why is it a story? Uh, you know, on one level, it shouldn't be a story. She obviously needs more clothes than she used in Wasilla, Alaska, uh, to be on the campaign trail as vice president. But she portrayed herself as a hockey Walmart mom and then to get bills to the Republican National Committee from Saks Fifth Avenue and Neiman Marcus suddenly contradicts that image. So I don't think it's just the fact that the clothes, it's the contradiction between the image she portrayed and what the clothes said. Um, you know, not so long ago, so go example, of course, is Bill Clinton, which we all remember, who really called upon our best instincts as he was president, 
as a nation and then gave in to his worst instincts with the Monica Lewinsky affair. Now, a lot of people have forgiven him for, God, for that. A lot of debate. Was it really that important? In Europe, it was not considered important at all. You know, I was ambassador to Switzerland at the time. They said, you know, what's, what's all the fuss about? Um, so it's probably more of an American uh, judgment call than it is in, in other countries. And then, you know, we had George Herbert Walker Bush with the famous Read My Lips, um, where he contradicted that by raising taxes. But if you put that in perspective, he probably did the right thing uh, by raising taxes to get us out of a deficit situation. But it was great ammunition uh, for the opposition. Um, as far as the war in Iraq, probably the biggest mistake politically that George Bush made was when he strung the banner across the destroyer. Was it a destroyer? A troop? Thank you, air carrier, and said, mission accomplished. And of course, five to six years later, we know it is far from accomplished. Um, if we look at this campaign with McCain and Obama, and I admit, obviously, to bias, uh, in case you didn't know that, <laughs> I put it on the table. But uh, I think we are seeing an interesting contrast in people's perception of authenticity. Uh, in the last debate, I was struck not so much by their differences in rhetoric, but their differences in body language and their comfort level with who they are. Um, my latest adventure is to write a blog on the Huffington Post, which is a lot of fun. You can say anything. And <laughs> I uh, described McCain as if he were wearing itchy long underwear. I mean, he couldn't quite sit still, or did he know quite how to posture himself? And of course, even his positions have changed, and some of that is attributable to being the underdog. You know, when you're the underdog, you keep searching. When you're ahead, you want to stay in place and stay on message. But I think one of the interesting things about Barack Obama, amongst many, is that he does seem comfortable in his own skin. The French say it even better, il est bien dans son peau. Uh, and he's grown into that. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that for the moment, though I'm not taking anything for granted, he is ahead because he provides a certain comfort level, not only to himself, but to the voters who in these gyrating economic times and uncertain uh, political times globally are looking for somebody who knows who he is. Um, he got there through a long journey, uh, probably a more tumultuous journey than most politicians go through, at least publicly, as described in his books. But he seems to have arrived at a place that gives us confident, confidence that this man is capable of leading. And when I say us, I'm not speaking, obviously, for everybody, just the people I meet. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but uh, I, how does this apply to women? Well, authenticity, I think, is a bit harder for women. Uh, leaders at the top, I'm not talking about legislators or congresswomen, but you know, women CEOs and women candidates for president or vice president. One for the obvious reason that we're not sure how they should behave because they are filling by and large roles that have been occupied by men. There have been some observations about that. Um, one is uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson, who some of you may watch on, on Bill Moyers. She wrote a book some years ago called The Double Bind um, in analyzing le women leaders. 
and more recently an organization called Catalyst, which does research on women in corporate America and also places women in, on boards and in CEO positions. Did a similar study called Damned If You Do and Doomed If You Don't. Um, I think you already get it. Um, what women at the apex of the pyramid have to fulfill is two sometimes contradictory requirements. They have to be tough enough for the job, tough as the male image which has preceded them. At the same time, they have to be soft enough and likable enough in order to be likable. So they have to fit into masculine and feminine roles. And if they go too far in one direction, they fall off. If they go too far in the other direction, they fall off. So it's a precarious balance. Doesn't mean it can't be done. Uh, women have done it and are doing it, as we know with female presidents in Liberia and Chile and Germany today, who are popular by and large and accepted. And interestingly, these are countries that are much less um, liberal, if you will, much have much less of a feminist history than the United States, but that's another story. So let me for a moment look at both Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin. Um, it's a compare and contrast. Uh, they're not equals, obviously, but as we saw in Hillary's campaign, and she is the first woman in the United States to be taken seriously as a candidate for president. 21 women have run, but we barely know their names. Um, Hillary, by the polls, met the toughness test. Uh, she was considered capable of being commander in chief. But then at the other end of the spectrum, she was considered cold. She was considered un incapable of really resonating with the public. Um, she got better at it as the primary continued and this became less of an issue as people got to know her as a person. The interesting thing is she never was questioned about her qualifications. Uh, she is the first woman to have been considered totally qualified. Let's look at Sarah Palin. Some, Times I get mixed up, and uh, one time I said Tina Palin, but uh, I have to be careful about that. We do have humor in American politics, don't you? Think? I mean, this is our saving grace. And Sarah Palin, I think, has met the toughness test, and interestingly enough, she has now more support from men uh, than she does from women. At first, there was a flurry of excitement. Uh, for the nomination, and it did, you know, put a lilt in John McCain's step. Um, but now there are questions. But she met the toughness <laughs> test, and I think part of that is Alaska. Um, I think you have to shoot something if you <laughs> if you get elected to office in Alaska. Um, so she can shoot wolves from helicopters. She's got a bearskin rug in her office. She meets, you know, she. Like she's a member of the NRA, you know, all those qualifications that make people like that side of her. She also meets the feminine test. She's got her five kids. She's attractive. Um, she smiles. She winks a bit. Um, but <laughs> she, she's the first woman, I have to say, who has had the courage to bring her children on stage. Um, when I was running for office in the 1970s, there was a big debate for women in my era as to whether we should even admit that we had young children, whether we should put their photographs in a brochure, now it would be a web page, but she has changed that equation. Uh, ironically, I think she is the beneficiary of the women's movement even though the Republican Party has accused the women's movement all these years of destroying the family. Um, I would also add, and this may be a bit more controversial, that the women's movement will be the beneficiary of Sarah Palin. And some may doubt that. There's some downsides too. You know, Some people say, well, they won't take us seriously. Uh, 
uh, they'll think we're another Sarah Palin or another babe or another pretty face. So there's a little downside, but there's also an upside. Because what it proves is that not all women need to be alike who run for high office. Uh, there is room for the Sarah Palins. There is room for the Hillary Clintons. But the big contrast, of course, is that people are asking Sarah Palin what they did not ask Hillary Clinton. Are you qualified? Uh, she was clearly qualified to be governor of Alaska. The people voted her in. She's popular in Alaska. But it is a giant step to go from that to vice president or president. So the jury is still out. But leadership for women is in most respects, I think, the same as leadership for men. You know, when I was governor, I was not radically different from the governors who preceded me. Probably 95% of the time I was similar. 5% of the time I was different. And that was because I emphasized somewhat different issues. Issues that <coughs> evolve from women's different experience. Whether that issue is subsidized childcare, whether that's initiating health insurance for children, whether that issue is pension for the environment, women do change the conversation. And they often change the conversation across party lines. Uh, but there is room for conservative women, democratic women, but most of all, there's room for more women. <laughs> I wish, and that was the purpose of my book, that we could elect more women in the United States and worldwide. Not only because I feel that's woman's rightful place, I feel that's democracy's rightful function, uh, that we should have a system of government that represents the population. And just as an homage to you, um, I talked to a woman member of parliament, Shirley, of the House of Lords. Oh, yeah. You know her. No. William, no. Shirley Williams. And she was here, she was here to visit some Vermont friends. And it was during the primary. And um, she said, I don't understand all this fuss about Hillary being a woman. Why, why are you Americans so concerned about this? Uh, when Margaret Thatcher was elected, we didn't go through this. And I said, well, what was the difference? And Shirley said, monarchy. In England, they are used to queens. And so my simple theory is the more women you see in public life, the more you get. Whether they're Margaret Thatcher, whether they're Sarah Palin, whether they're Hillary Clinton, Barbara Boxer, Jean Shaheen, it becomes less of a phenomenon and also less of a burden for each woman to be all things, not only to all women, but to all people. for inviting me to participate on this distinguished panel, and I'm left as the dull academic, um, I suppose. Uh, when I was uh, asked to participate in a panel on presidential morality, my, my first reaction was, well, this will be quick. Um, <laughs> because over, over the last several presidents, we, we've had to have public debates about what the words SEX and WMDs mean and whether the president's meaning fits with conventional understanding. Um, I remember when my then seven-year-old daughter uh, heard on the news a discussion of WMDs. Uh, she asked me, what's a WMD? And I was uh, in the middle of uh, doing something, and I said, well, it's, uh, let me explain it to you in a minute. And she said, is this another one of those things I can't know about? <laughs> the, uh, I want to frame my remarks around uh, three different thickets or tests that, that a president has to negotiate in order to, to get elected and serve in office. And each one of these three tests uh, may or may not promote morality and may, in some cases, undermine hopes of morality. Um, the first of these tests is that the men and women who run for the office of the president may not be the most moral among us. It may take a, a certain level of hubris or pride, as Pope Gregory you know, labeled it the cardinal sin, to seek the office in the first place. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a literature in political science on how different the people who seek the office of the president are from the rest of us, focusing in large part on Richard Nixon. 
uh, that literature subsided during the 1980s, came back a bit during the 1990s with Bill Clinton. It's never a literature that I, I liked too much, um, but there are a number of accounts of uh, or biographies of presidents and how seeking the office was a way to overcome either failings or problems in their childhood. And that may or may not be the case, but even if it is or isn't, the, the, the important thing, I guess, for us to ask is, uh, do we have the right incentives in place to attract the kinds of people who we would want to be president, that is moral and ethical people. Um, the second thicket is the election itself. Modern campaigns demand a dose of unethical behavior, stretching the truth of one's opponent's words and actions, hiding the truth of one's own failures. At the end of the campaign, the ultimate judge is the voter who may or may not select the most moral or ethical or even qualified of the candidates. And the third thicket or, or test is the office of the president itself. Governing has all the moral hazards of campaigning, and then quite a few more. Um, so I thought I would talk a bit about each one of these thickets and, and, and where I think the most important filter or, or test is uh, for um, promoting morality in the presidency, and that's the first two, the people who choose to run and then how we, how we view them when we, we go into the voting booth. We expect much of presidents. If I could come up with a definition of a good president, it would be someone who's smart, hardworking, socially graceful, physically fit, intellectually curious, worldly yet common, confident yet humble, compassionate, steady in temperament, unwavering in principles yet able to compromise, a moral example to all of us, and able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Uh, in other words, our ideal president is almost superhuman, and if we were ever lucky enough to find such a person, we, would, we might think him or her an elitist snob or goody two-shoes um, who doesn't understand the problems faced by most people. So this is a contradiction of political leadership in general and of the American presidency in particular. We expect our president to be superhuman and yet to be very human. And we harbor a fear that the men and women who run for office, uh, for the highest office, may be neither. The last president and the next one will have instituted a new tactic in campaigning, the confession, where John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton all sought to hide their moral failures President Bush and candidates McCain and Obama confess theirs before and during the campaign. President Bush is a born-again Christian, erasing in the minds uh, of voters the moral failings of his youth that are well documented. John McCain has spoken repeatedly of the youthful arrogance that landed him in a prison camp in Hanoi and the five and a half years that he had to reflect on his errors. Last night, Barack Obama ended his, what I thought was remarkable, 30-minute uh, campaign uh, advertisement with this line. I am reminded every single day that I am not a perfect man. Where Bill Clinton said he smoked marijuana but didn't inhale, Obama had said repeatedly that he did inhale and that that was the point. <laughs> and, and this, I think, has instituted a new form of public confession. There was even a debate in which uh, the moderator asked the Democratic candidates, how many of you smoked marijuana? And they were eager to raise their hands. And so one of the things that, that, that may, um, uh, to, to think about the governor's remark, uh, may be an interesting contrast between men and women seeking public life in the future is will women have the same leeway and opportunity to engage in the public confession that men now uh, seem almost required to? And, and what would that public confession entail? And I think you know, we may see yet another double standard uh, for men and women in office. Um, presidents are elected by people who hardly know them. Our, our president is not a prime minister elected by his peers in the legislature. The American president is elected by the people through the filter of the Electoral College and what carries whatever moral authority the people bestow upon him. Uh, but in the academic literature, the uh, moral authority of the, the common man doesn't get, uh, doesn't get a lot of support, and, and the framers of the Constitution seem to reflect that as well. Um, H. L. Mencken wants to find democracy as the process by which out of 20 million qualified Americans, Calvin Coolidge could be chosen as president. <laughs> Uh, when when uh, Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson was running for president in the 1950s, you may recall, a, a, a supporter yelled out to him, Governor Stevenson, all thinking men are for you. And Stevenson replied, that's nice, but I need a majority. <laughs> and then in the late 19th century, uh, the, the British uh, author and uh, member of parliament, Lord Bryce, in his book, The American Commonwealth, even titled a chapter, Why Good Men Are Not Chosen President. His contemporary, political science professor Woodrow Wilson, agreed with Bryce's endorsement of parliamentary instead of presidential government as a way to get good men to the office of president. That is until Wilson himself was elected president, and then I think he found the process just fine. 
despite some evidence to the contrary, voters do seem capable of using a number of cognitive shortcuts and just plain instinct to make good decisions. Um, the the uh, Sunday edition of New York Times Magazine carried a very, very good article on the McCain campaign and how Steve Schmidt, one of Cam uh, McCain's advisors, recounted a story uh, where in 2004 he was sitting in a meeting with George Bush. They were lamenting the poor prospects of re-election due to the Iraq war and a number of other things. And Bush seemed unflapped and uh, told everyone, you know, at the end of the day, the American voter can really see into the character of the people running for president and make the right decision, uh, which may have been that cardinal sin of hubris yet again. Um, but Bush uh, believed, and I think most, uh, most political science, at least of, of the contemporary age, would say that voters use a number of shortcuts to actually make pretty good decisions. And the people who make these pretty good decisions are the late deciders, the ones who aren't partisans. They aren't ideologues. They're making their decision based on the state of the economy, how things have gone over the past year or the previous four years. Their decision rule seems to be simple. Uh, the political scientist V.O. Key described them as a rational god of vengeance and reward. If things are going well, we'll send them back to office. If things are going poorly, we'll vote for the challenger. And that threat alone seems to be the most important instrument for promoting morality in the president. That is the threat of being thrown out of office. Well, those are some provocative thoughts. And we want to open it up to you. Um, and let me know if you want to address to, to any one particular person. that um, we're still going through, and some of the ads that are out there. And the one in particular that disturbs me so much is the campaign, I guess it was a flyer or mailer, uh, essentially accusing Barack Obama of being a terrorist. And it says terrorist at the top, and then it says uh, they don't care who they harm. And then it opens up, there's a picture of Barack Obama, and at the bottom it says, Barack Obama, you don't know who he is, or something like that. And to me, that is just inciting the possibility of assassination. Mm -hmm. And it is something that I am so profoundly disturbed about. And what does it say about the character of a man who heads up a campaign that allows that to happen? That's my question. Did you want that directed to anyone in no. person? I, I suppose to, to them, but I think to all. Well, it is very disturbing. Uh, you're right. It may not, you know, in all honesty, come directly from him, but if it's, and sometimes these are hard to trace. They're sometimes anonymous emails or anonymous letters. The public and national community. This is, okay, well, that we can trace. Um, <laughs> I think what disturbed me in the same vein was some of the rallies uh, where people were encouraged to shout responses to who is Barack Obama. And I had the same anxiety level that you did, but I don't know how we can stop it, to tell you the truth. Um, the only way we can really curb it is by public outrage uh, and by not being drawn into it. And, What's impossible to know is how big that responsive audience is. Is it speaking only to people who already have made up their minds for John McCain, who already dislike Obama for whatever reasons or distrust him? Or is it leaching out to the undecideds you talked about? And that's, that's very hard to know. I mean, we can't, the press is doing something with truth squads. Um, and you'll see it even on the evening news sometimes, the, the fact checkers. Um, and I think that's healthy, but it's, you know, it's not ever in the headlines. It's the, the uh, footnote to the news, but at least it's better than nothing. Question in the front row. Did you have your hand up? Um, <clears throat> I think that we are not going to have um, campaign finance reforms until we reform campaigning. Mm -hmm. And I think the, one of the ways we could do it is for Congress to amend the Constitution so that they can regulate campaigning or elections and have it carried out by the states, but to set some ground rules that must not be. Uh, I think one of the things we must do is examine these awful touchscreen <coughs> machines that you know you push for one 
and you get another. And this has been going on all over, it's going on now in Florida, and they're trying to document it. But my feeling is that we are in danger of losing our democratic republic. Remember, Franklin said you have a republic if you can keep it. And I think, by the way, our elections are carried on. We're so near the tipping point of losing. That's a great question. Maybe, Dean, you could address that? I think you'll see a, a major change in campaign finance law after this election because Obama has, and I mean this uh, in a figurative sense, blown the law out of the water, not by violating it, but by making it irrelevant. Um, public financing of presidential elections will be a thing of the past now because the amount of money that a presidential candidate can get through public funding, we adjust for inflation, it's around $135, $140 million, maybe $150, $160 million, $70 million by the next election, and Obama has uh, raised uh, $450 million, three times more than that in this election. The next Republican candidate will have to raise that much, and so the, the, the principle of public funding of, of presidential campaigns and the laws associated with it will have to be revised almost wholesale after this election in order to Right. Yeah, I mean, well, I think they'll have to revisit, revisit everything, um, simply because public financing of presidential elections, the only elections we have financed uh, potentially publicly at the national level, will no longer be relevant. Great. Yes. This is a follow-up, I think, to the uh, same question. Uh, our neighbors to the north have just had a major national election in a six-week time frame and have you know, gone through that whole process, <laughs> packaged it, it's a, it's a done deal. We've been in this process for well over two years now uh, in some way, shape, or form. And it, I think that we've gotten to almost voter fatigue mm -hmm. uh, as far as issues, as far as the news, as far as, especially for the general public that may not be as engaged as many of us <coughs> are in this room to the issues and whatever. And, and I fear that, that it, there are some downsides to caliber of, of candidates and, and what we actually receive from the media uh, as far as uh, information that's necessary to make that in, informed decision at a point in time you know, when the election finally happens. Well, I think I agree with you. you know, you know, the news media is flashing five more days, and some of us are saying, thank God. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I'm sure you both have additions to this, but one is the difference in the parliamentary system where you can call an election um, and set a certain time period, and that's almost impossible to do uh, in the United States. And as much as I would like a law to be passed for a six-week campaign period, I mean, camp Painting and all the accoutrements are a major industry in the United States. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of money uh, that is being made, so, and there would be the freedom of speech issue. So I think it would be very, very hard uh, to curtail it. Do you have any thoughts on how you could? Well, it is the presidential system and the fact that we have presidential primaries to select the nominees and then a general election that makes the campaign process so much longer here. And, I, I like the presidential system. I mean, it, it is exciting for me uh, to watch, but that's because it's my profession to watch. Um, um, but I, I, I do think we end up uh, fatiguing voters, certainly, and it would be nice to shorten the season. Let me raise a, a potentially pessimistic note. Um, in the state of Georgia, if no candidate for a Senate race gets more than 50 percent of the vote, there's a runoff four weeks later. There's a very strong possibility that there will be a runoff for the Georgia Senate seat that may be the 60th seat that the Democrats could pick up. If that happens in between November Election Day and four weeks later, you will see the most intense Senate campaign in recent memory, and it will be covered on the national news, so the election might not be over. <laughs> I'll just say the good news is, and I think we're all aware of this, is there's been such terrific participation and interest. Um, and I don't, I've never seen an election campaign like this. So while it's been long and dragged out, I mean, the audiences for these debates, the participation in the primaries, the number of young people, you wouldn't know by our audience here today, but <laughs> the number of young people who, who <laughs> are voting, are interested, I mean, that's great news for America. Great, it's a great drama. I mean, I don't think, at least in the world in which I travel, and 
recently I've been living in, back in my known native country, there has been an election ever, the only one one could think of that might be uh, in competition would be the Kennedy-Nixon right. election that has excited so many people and which, by the way, has informed so many people um, about America. It's been an educative experience. But I also have to say that part of the drama is because of the interesting people involved, mm -hmm. whether Hillary Clinton or John McCain or Sarah Palin or Barack Obama. Uh, who did I admit? Joe Biden. <laughs> um, you know, this is a great, I don't mean to diminish it, it's a great soap opera. It's a great, it's a compelling, compelling spectacle. But if you asked me, <coughs> would I want to put up with two years of, of George Brown versus David Cameron, I would say no. Let's, <laughs> let's stick with the three weeks, three weeks in England. We, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Harry? Mr. Burns, a question. If, if Obama is an elected president, do you think politically he has any options with regard, other options with regard to the war in Afghanistan, given uh, the long-term sentiments of the American public about uh, the need to uh, defeat al-Qaeda and the Taliban? Yeah, much has been said in the last two or three weeks about the possibility of of negotiations. Um, I think the first thing that needs to be said about that is the Taliban, there's no possibility of any element of the Taliban negotiating seriously until until they see uh, the United States and its allies beginning to prevail, which they're not doing now. They have no reason to negotiate at present because although the generals say we're not losing, they do say we're not winning, and you can make up your own minds about what that means. But if you look at the map of Afghanistan, you can see that as judged by both U.S. military command and the United Nations, the whole area to the south of the Hindu Kush, which was green, yellow, and red until 18 months or two years ago, is entirely red now. There's no safe place south of the Hindu Kush, and that's, you know, half of the country, and it's the Pashtun half of the country. Things are not going well there. And it seems to me that Senator Obama, as president, has first of all got to demonstrate uh, that he's serious about this war, as he said he is, and that he doesn't, that he intends to prevail, that will perhaps two years down the road engender a climate with people who've been at war for 30 years. Just remember, the Taliban are uh, nothing but an agglomeration uh, in the main of people who um, have been either personally or in the, in the persons of their fathers or uncles or fighting ever since uh, before the Soviets arrived, since 1978, so it's 30 years this year. There is an exhaustion factor. The Taliban is not a, uh, it's not a homogeneous organization. There are p parts of the Taliban that are more Islamist than nationalists, parts that are more nationalist than Islamist. Uh, they, because they're an agglomeration of the Mujahideen fighters who fought the Soviets, there are deep uh, personal rivalries and fissures. Uh, there is possibilities for negotiation, but they're some way down the road, and I'm afraid in the meantime, the dynamic within the Taliban will be towards radicalism. Uh, anybody who puts his hand up and says, I'm ready to talk, is likely to end up getting his head cut off. Um, and, and the predominant prevailing voice is, of course, that of Mullah Muhammad Omar, who survived the very first bomb of these two wars on terror on the night of October the 7th, 2001. He's somewhere, U.S. intelligence believes, in the area of Quetta, Pakistan, and he issues regular pronouncements on the internet, and th which he leaves absolutely no doubt that his purpose remains to vanquish the United States, drive it out as they drove the Soviets out, and to remain allied to Al Qaeda and its uh, wider uh, ambitions to attack the United States. So I think, unfortunately, this war is going to have to be fought and fought hard for some time before we can begin to think of anything like a negotiated settlement. One last question. Um, just given what you just said about the sort of necessity of, of saying the war to this war, um, it seems to me that what's going to end up being the question is what image is going to be placed on this war and what image is going to be projected by whoever is our next president in their policies that they pursue. And I feel like at the beginning of this whole campaign, it started off as there's this big emphasis on change, and this one candidate represents 
change and peace and troops coming home, and the other one is supposed to represent, you know, staying the course and and not changing. And over time, like through all the debates and through all the different developments, I feel like that whole issue has just become so much more convoluted, and the two have become closer and kind of crossed over on the different issues. And I guess what my question in my head right now is, is are we, given the vast unpopularity of, of this, this whole situation, are we trying to, or should we try to convince people that stay in the course that, that what is happening is right despite the fact that it's unpopular, or to continue to try and portray the image that there are changes being made? And I think it's directed at you. In the way. You're talking about Afghanistan, or you're talking about bigger issues. Well, let's take one of the big. Yeah, one of the big challenges. Whoever is president, and especially for Obama, because he has, he has initiated and sustained the change mantra, is very high expectations and uh, also expectations that change is going to happen quickly. And, you know, your generation, even more than my generation, you know, is used to pushing the delete button, uh, is used to switching channels. Uh, when we don't like something, we just move on. Uh, we've all become accustomed to that to some extent. And I think the complexities of the economic situation, the political situation, will not be rectified uh, immediately. And I think the next president, and again, particularly Obama, is going to have to have a lot of support. Um, you know, you talked about what, what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did with World War II to get the support of a nation. Well, he worked exceedingly hard at that, if you read any of, of the history. I mean, it didn't just happen. Uh, it was a whole campaign and so I think the next president is going to have to constantly be in a dialogue with the American people to, to extend their patience, to retain their support, and to make some uncomfortable decisions. I mean, I think Obama did use the word sacrifice recently, which we haven't heard. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the questions will be, how much sacrifice are the American people willing to engage in, and I think that's an unknown. Dean, do you want to add to that? Yeah, you, I think you can, it could say that the next president has been dealt the worst hand of anyone becoming president since the early 1930s with the Depression and the rise of fascism in, in Europe. Now, that means that Obama has a tremendous challenge, or McCain. Another way to look at it is there's not much way to go but up. Um, and the best presidents, the ones that are rated the best by historians, are the ones that start with a pretty poor hand. Roosevelt, Lincoln, um, and the next one may be up there as well, um, and, and are able to, uh, to pull out a victory. Um, you know, let me tie the, the last three questions together. Um, one of the things I think that historically the best presidents have displayed is a combination of self-doubt and flexibility. And many of the worst ones have had neither of those, have had moral certainty and have been inflexible. So Lincoln constantly doubted himself uh, when he was uh, uh, managing the Civil War. Um, Roosevelt doubted himself constantly. I'm not sure that the last president has doubted himself much. Um, and, the, the, and Nixon didn't seem to doubt himself much. Um, and American voters are very willing to accept changing positions. Um, David Brooks once said, of all the uh, um, political sins, one of the least, uh, least important is hypocrisy. And is changing one's position is easy in politics. Um, and, and I think if, if Obama ends up saying, you know, it won't be easy to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan, we need to stay there a little longer, voters will understand you know, that that's, that's, the card, that's the hand he's been dealt, and uh, they'll, they'll forgive him for changing positions. Exactly. John, do you want to add anything to that? Last word. Yeah, I mean, there is encouraging. Uh, it is possible, which we would not have thought even 18 months ago, uh, that uh, there can be a measured drawdown in Iraq but the key is measured. Um, everything that has been gained in Iraq and is very substantial and, and by the way, uh, understated 
normally say thank God, by the US military commanders who have been largely responsible for that, who are not again going to get caught in illusionism. Um, it, all of it, one way or another, does connect to the US military presence in Iraq. Um, and that's the considered view of the smartest of my colleagues who have been there recently, including Dexter Filkins, my colleague who has a book new in the bookstore about these wars. Um, but we may hope that either Senator McCain or Senator Obama will be able to begin a drawdown. Uh, the problem is, of course, that that's directly connected to the war in Afghanistan, because if you get the troops in uh, Iraq down, shall we say, to 100,000 by the end of 2009, um, or the spring of 2010, which is probably about as ambitious as you could be, uh, the American commander in, in Afghanistan has already said he needs three, three more combat brigades, and uh, Gates and George Casey, now chief of staff, have said the only place this can come from is from the units being drawn down. So there's not much prospect of a net relief in all of this um, for some time, but I do think what you say is extremely sage. It will make a huge difference uh, to have somebody, uh, it would make a huge difference to have somebody who was not a maker of this war. Um, and the American people are uh, intelligent people, and I think they probably would would bear with this and the blood and the treasure, but it was not going to be easy. You know, 4,500 troops have died in Iraq. So far, 610 have died, American troops, in Afghanistan. And that 610 could grow quite quickly over the next two or three years. And I've heard John McCain say in Baghdad that he might as easily been talking about Iraq, about um, Afghanistan that American intolerance for body bags coming home is the crucial determinant of this. He would say that, wouldn't he, because of the war in which, in which he fought. Um, so it's going, to be t it's going to be a very tough road for the new president. Well, no matter our political inclinations, I think we can all agree this is a, it's a very exciting election. I think the matter of character does it is an important issue for all of us. Um, on behalf of the Dorset Fellowship and the Ethics Institute, I really thank you for joining us this afternoon. And please thank our panelists. Thank you.